Yeah, you're talking about um, just oh, like flooding and stuff like that. Oh yeah, that, we didn't get affected by that stuff, you know. So it's all been good. Good, good. Mm -hmm. It's all been good. Nice. Yeah, really. Uh, it's really nice. Like I was telling you, you earlier, that was a great uh, um, star party last night again. Of course, with uh, just hearing all the the people who knew and the family who knew. Uh, John, right, Dobson. Oh and, yeah. Uh, you know, reflecting on all the neat experiences. Yeah. All the people. Life. I mean, a lot of the people. You know, they really felt like they were family. You know. Yes. Connected yes. to him. And uh, you had some good uh, experiences yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, virtually everybody that met him. I mean, unless he was like, I mean, you heard maybe that during during some of. Uh, his uh he would get in these moods where he was a little ornery you know uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. and he would challenge you on on how you felt about or what what you knew about the universe and stuff like you know uh yes. you see earth rises and earth sets on the moon right right mm -hmm. actually you know what that reminds me there was one excellent video that's still in the archives on the winter star party you recall uh where where there was a, a very nice long clip uh yeah. where i was where john, Do john dobson was giving a, a seminar i i think i think it was actually at a past winter star party is it right and and i think it was he was often at winter star party that's for sure yeah, yeah and it was really good it was quite a long clip it really and it, to your point it, it showed his kind of his emotions and his style <laughs> and yeah. his, his confrontational uh, approach, right? He, he, he would occasionally, yeah. He, he would he actually, like the provocative is maybe a better, better way of saying it. Uh, he, he really loved to um, ask people to challenge him and, and then encounter them. But it was, once you get, go through that, he, he really, that's where he's in his element. He really thrives and really loves to bounce ideas and, and yeah talk about his, his uh, deep philosophy and, and deep uh, theories, right, on, on the universe. It's, it's really cool. I mean, a really deep thinking person, for sure. Yeah. I think, I think that um, uh, some of his, uh, you know, the challenges he'd throw out to people was, was part of his monastic training. Yes. Uh, you know, because... Yes. Uh, I mean, if you think of like, um, you know, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I haven't studied the kind of uh, religious philosophical teachings that he studied, but I think many of them are similar to uh, uh, to some of the uh, teachings in Buddhism. And in Buddhism, uh, you're required to, I mean, it is it not required, but it is very much encouraged to question absolutely everything about the religion. Okay. And, yes. uh, you know, not take anything verbatim or just say, yeah, it was written down by Buddha 2,500 years ago. Therefore, it's the truth. They, they don't do that. <laughs> they, don't do that. they will absolutely question everything that, that uh, you understand and, and, um, and, and just question the, the validity of that particular teaching, you know, and, yes. uh, uh, the ones that uh, can't stand that kind of scrutiny are actually thrown out in the Buddhist religion, in that tradition. Yes. They might no, be they're... kept around as kind of like historical kinds of things, but not like current um, thinking, you know, so. Yes, yes. No, it's a quite a, and it's, it's very, uh, like you say, very high discipline and uh, very. Um... Oh, yeah, to be a monk. Requires yeah. a lot. It sure does. Very high. Yeah. So it's a very strong mental training ground for sure. Yeah. You know, and staying staying with all those vows and the stuff that they take and. Oh yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Oh, he t he definitely was had a life journey. Amazing. Yeah. You know, around just around World War Two, uh, when I guess he was saying. 37 he was he was um 
you know, confrontational atheist. And then, yeah. uh, then there was the war and, uh, and then he wanted to get into the, the university, um, to the, the to the monastic, 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 uh, yeah. university. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then he, he got in, I think 43 or something like that, right. Or 44. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then after that, he, uh, he continued along that path. It's it's amazing. Well, he's, yep. then he's also thrown out at one point from the yeah. monastery for <laughs> pursuing his interest in astronomy. Telescope grinding. Yeah, exactly. Telescope making. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Grinding, grinding mirrors in his spare time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's really interesting. It's kind of two two different things, right? We we know in the telescope equipment side. I mean, obviously in the in the whole we know from the. Oh. That is a solid drill for sure. Yeah, so so this is a test for a Martian rover and a, a, a drill to you know drill deep. The big piece of Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. And I'm here with uh, uh, Kent Martz and Cameron Gillis. And uh, uh, Cameron and I were talking about, uh, about the celebration of uh, John Dobson's birthday uh, uh, last night uh, that we did with the sidewalk astronomers. Uh, they were originally called the San Francisco sidewalk astronomers, many of them uh, you know, uh, had uh, experiences with John Dobson when he first got started in uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, and then there were people from all over the world. There was a guy from uh, Russia that was on the program. There was uh, people from, you know, everywhere. It was amazing how uh, how he got around the world without uh, without a, a paying job. You know, he was basically um sponsored uh most of his life he lived to a pretty ripe old age i think it was 98 years old something like that and um um he was uh uh you know he led a life uh pretty much on his own terms but uh he was out there to uh turn people on to the universe and uh you know he clearly understood the benefits of what it was to you know, explore the the uh, the cosmos on your own, you know, in a personal way, and so that's part of what we talk about, and part of what our mission is here too, uh, with our programs, you know, with Global Star Party, First Light Chronicles, Cam Astronomy, um, you know, our focus on astrophotography program, uh, and the rest of the pro special programming that we do as well. So. I hope you guys are enjoying it. I hope you had a great uh, time celebrating uh, John Dobson's birthday with us as well. So it's very cool. Uh, this afternoon, we have decided to focus uh, on different aspects of uh, uh, beginner uh, astronomy. And uh, Kent, uh, Kent, what do we got this, this week? Well, this week I'm going to talk about um, 
Am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Wow. For once. <laughs> this week, <laughs> I thought, hey, Cameron. I could mute you, I guess, you know. Yes, you, you like. could. And I could unmute myself. Okay. So, you know, uh, going to talk about planetary and lunar uh, astronomy. And so, you know, the question is, you know, what telescope do I need? Um, last week, we, we looked a little bit at using a astronomy.tool field of view calculator and learned that uh, even under pretty high power, planets can uh, be very uh, fuzzy uh, and small. Uh, and small. More, and they're small. far away, you know. Uh, they're far away and they're, they're big, but they're not big like galaxies are big. So overall... Uh, you know, what what telescope do you want to use? Well, yeah, the one you have if I'm, is a, the, if I'm a beginner and I'm coming to you, Kent, and I know nothing about telescopes or astronomy, uh, and I've decided that I, you know, I want to just explore our yep. solar system from my backyard. And, and my advice is going to be the planets and the moon are easy targets. Yeah. You, you don't have to pick them out from a field of a bunch of stars. It's obvious when you get them. And like right now, we have Venus up in the evening. Uh, the moon is well placed tonight. It's moving towards full. So it'll get, you know, a full moon doesn't look good in a telescope. But we also have uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn and Jupiter moving from west east. So Venus, Saturn, Jupiter all up as soon as it gets dark, really easy to see. And the biggest bang for the buck easily is a uh, Dobsonian telescope. You know, talking about John Dobson, which a, a Dobsonian telescope is simply a Newtonian telescope on a very simple alt as mount that sits on the ground. And Scott has an example. So you're looking, we didn't plan this out, but Scott has an example back there over his shoulder. Right. Uh, ben, I had this up yesterday as a, oh, okay. kind of a you know, homage to Dobson. John yeah, Dobson. Yeah, to John so, Dobson. So Scott, so. bend that down a little bit so they can see what it is, if you would, please. So, as you can see, that's awesome. It's on his tabletop thing. Right? Yeah. That's so cool. And I so that's a that's the prototype for what we call the Dob 1045C. Now, uh, we sell this on our website. Uh, Costco sells a, a version of it. Um, it's and this is not a sales pitch, but a a ten inch telescope, Dobsonian telescope. That telescope is $600 on our website, um, $599.99. So, Cameron, you know, what would it cost to get a 10 inch refractor? Scott? Oh my how gosh. Much? Hundreds of thousands. dollars maybe? Yeah, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Maybe yeah. hundreds of thousands. Yeah. 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 So, so, you can, so, you can get a ready to go telescope. And, and most companies that sell Dobsonian telescopes, also include an eyepiece or two, or two, and we do as well. And it's a package that will get you started. Comes with a red dot finder, and literally you can get the telescope today. Put the red dot on it. Go outside tonight. Point it at the moon. Now you're gonna have to get the red dot collimated with a telescope, which you know you find something long ways off to the eyepiece of the telescope. Move the red dot to where it's lined up. But now at night when you go out. You put the red dot on the moon, bingo, you're now looking at the moon. Simple. There's no motors to figure out. There's no hand controls. Well, there are hand controls. There's your yes, left hand, hand control. and your, your right hand. hand. And I'm controlling the telescope. So, real, real time, as many <laughs> so, degrees as, per second as you want. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it literally is, a, it, it's a two, it has a two-hand controller, controller. Yeah. And literally, you grab it up there. Scott, show them how you'd move it. Where you'd put your hand normally to move it. You'd grab oh, the in, end of the habit is I would grab I would it right there and I that's it. About right here. And okay. I would I would pro this this has it assembled with the eyepiece at 12 o'clock high. Um you know, depending on how I might use this telescope, I could also put that eyepiece over here or over here. So you know it's easily assembled that way. But uh Again, we're not here to sell a, a telescope, but right. but but Kent's right. Okay, this is this is a great uh, uh, beginner telescope, and the reason why it's a great beginner telescope is that uh, you're, it's easier to see 
faint detail, okay? And there's faint detail on galaxies, okay, which this could also see, but there's faint detail on planets. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so with, with more resolving power, you can start to see um, some of these uh, features that might otherwise go missed on, like my first telescope. Okay, this is mine. Uh, it had, uh, you know, had a flimsy tripod, um, had a terrible finder scope on it. If I'd had, if I'd started out with this, it would have been way easier for me to do astronomy. You know, uh, much sturdier mount, much easier to find things in the sky, um, and. Uh, I don't know. This was bought in 1970 for just under 20 bucks, but I, I don't know what that means in today's dollars. It's probably still, I, I don't know, over $100 for, for a, a small refractor uh, based off of uh, 1970 cost. So, so, so $20 yeah. in 1970. Mm -hmm. Let me do this real quick. Yeah, it was $17.50 exactly is what it was. Let's do $20. It's an easy number. Yeah. In 1970, Twenty dollars is worth a hundred and forty-four dollars today. One hundred forty-four bucks. Okay. Now, for one hundred and forty-four bucks today, you can get a much better telescope than what you got for one hundred and forty-four. Oh yeah, one hundred and forty-four dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I would still be regularly using it even today. You yeah. know because. Uh, it's very, very difficult to exhaust what a 10 inch can show you. So you know? let's, let's talk about what 10 inches means. Okay. So what we're talking about is the measure across the uh, open end of the telescope. Okay. So it's, it's like a fire hose versus a garden hose. You know, Scott's telescope is, we'll say a garden hose. Show them the end of your, of the, of yeah, the, this is the a, telescope. This is a, What's that? 50, 40 millimeter, 40 millimeter telescope. Okay. 40 millimeter telescope. Not even two inches. 10 inches to millimeters is, I don't remember if it was, 254 millimeters. So it, it's like a fire hose, except in reverse. Instead of squirting a little hose, squirts out a little bit of water. A big fire hose squirts out a whole lot of water. Well, it's the reverse. A little bitty telescope, like the 40 millimeter, sucks in a little bit of photons, but that 10 inch telescope sucks in a whole lot more photons. And it's all about focusing them down and having all those photons go in the pupil of your eye. So effectively, the diameter of the telescope, your pupil becomes the diameter of the telescope. That's so right. imagine if, you, if we all had 10 inch diameter eyes, what we could see if that pupil can be 10 inches in diameter. And so it's basically a telescope is just a tool that makes your eye bigger. And for bang for the buck, dollar for dollar, a Dobsonian telescope is a tremendous entry point. It was the, a four and a half inch telescope, Dobsonian telescope was the first telescope I bought. Um, I still have it. I still use it periodically. Um, I have never cleaned the mirror. I have uh, collimated it sort of maybe one time. It just works. I treat it. I carefully transport it, but uh, the version that Scott has in, on his desk is a truss tube. So it comes apart. That upper white cage comes off. The tubes come off of the bottom mirror box. Then the mirror box lifts, lifts up out of the ground plate. And so it's much more transportable, collapses down. Uh, a lot of the other version of a 10 inch or, or Dobsonian telescopes are just solid tubes where it's just like a big, long piece of pipe. And if you have a uh, car with a good sized back seat or a good trunk, you can transport a good sized, uh, you know, telescope tube back there. But if you've got a small car, it presents a challenge to transport a big Dobsonian telescope. And I uh, saw a guy pull up one time at a star party and he had a 16 inch um, solid tube Dobsonian from another company. And he had his front seat passenger seat laid forwards, the backward, the back passenger seat laid forwards, and it barely fit in his car. And it was a sedan, but it was a great big old honking telescope. So it's wants and needs. Everybody wants a big aperture, but you have this need to be able to transport it places, unless you're going to use well, it in your backyard. 
But even also, too, you, you know, if it was me, if I if we went back to my 1970 self, I'm 10 years old. Uh, I probably could not have dealt physically myself with this telescope. Right. And it turned out that my parents were not into astronomy. Okay. At all. They knew I was very, very interested, and they got me this telescope to kind of satisfy that, you know, fascination, that desire. But, uh, you know, I was on my own. I had to learn what I learned about astronomy uh, with, without any real help, you know, and there wasn't, a, there wasn't a guru in the neighborhood that knew how to find Saturn or any of that stuff. So, you know, it was, so I, I have my experiences with my small scope, uh, looking at the moon, looking at stars. Uh, it was years later that I actually saw Saturn for the first time through a, still a small refractor, uh, was mind blowing for me. Um, but, uh, you know, I was probably 20 at the time. So 10 years passed. Okay. Before I got my first glimpse at something as amazing as, as Saturn. And then, uh, my first telescope, uh, that I got beyond this one was a Dobsonian, but it was 13 inches in diameter. And was it I, Coulter? It was a Coulter and I just got a super deal on it. So, you know, and, um, and I had uh, a lot of fun with that telescope. You know, I was looking at galaxies, nebula, comets, look, watching. I saw Halley's Comet in 1985, you know, when everybody else was watching it in 1986. You know, so I could pick it out of, uh, you know, from, from, and it looked like, just looked like a really faint star at the time. So, so Scott brings up a good subject. I started out this segment talking about doing lunar and planetary, uh, you know, because those are big, bright, easy targets. But, you know, Saturn looks the same night after night. Jupiter, the moons move, and you can actually see the moons move, especially when a moon gets really close to the planet. You can sit there and watch it over five minutes and see it moving closer and closer, and then it touches, and it starts disappearing from behind, or it starts coming out on the other side. That's cool. You can look at the moon over half an hour under, you know, good magnification and see the shadow line, which is called the terminator. It's where the sunlight terminates and watch it move across the, the lunar landscape and see valleys and, and, and uh, craters and mountains and, and lines and fractures and all sorts of stuff. You can start seeing it. Like anything else, the longer you look, the more you see. But after a certain period of time, you want to turn it to something else, okay? That's where you get into, like Scott said, this telescope is also good for galaxy and nebula and stuff like that. The problem you face is you're going to have to do, if you're under you know, like 70 or 80% of the people in the United States, you have pretty badly light polluted skies. So you're going to have to do a little bit more work to find the faint fuzzies. And the problem becomes if the sky is brighter than those faint fuzzies, you see the sky, you don't see the faint fuzzy. And, you know, Cameron is taking pictures of things that he probably can't see, but his camera can because our Mark one uh, version alpha eyeballs are great for certain things, but they don't build up data. Cameron's camera builds up data and that allows the camera to see things that the eyeball can't. But, you know, I, I really like looking using the Mark one eyeball that we have uh, um, a nod to our friend, Mike Wiesner for, or was it Ed Gunther, Ed Gunther for coming up with the uh, Mark one eyeball uh, that we all are gifted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. that's that's where I got that term from was Ed Gunther. So okay. anyway, so, so Ken, I think I th I think that you've explained uh, you know these aspects very well for you know a potential beginner. All right, um, uh, it, you know what? How about the same beginner, but they they need something more portable? What are you going to direct them to? Something more portable. Uh, what are we talking about? Like a uh, Mac Cas? I don't know. You know, a Mac Cas, Maxitov Cassegrain. It has a lot of focal length in a small package. Uh, a Maxitov Cassegrain, a Mac Cas, um, or a Schmidt Cassegrain, a, a SCT, um, are, you know, offer a lot of aperture, a whole lot of focal length, more focal length than is in the Dobsonian behind Scott. 
um, in a very, you know, very small package. Uh, you know, that telescope behind Scott is probably, I don't remember the measurements, but three and a half feet, you know, the tube is three and a half feet. Um, you know, a big Mac CAS, you know, an eight or a 10 inch Mac CAS is probably a 16 or 17 inch tube. Um, you know, so uh, because the light path is folded inside a couple of three times. So a Mac CAS or a Schmidt Cassegrain are much more portable. Uh, you have to have a tripod. Uh, you know, you're going to have to probably polar line the telescope or like Cameron, you're going to have one that's got an arm that, that, that a telescope is on an alt as mount just on an arm. Um, and uh, you'll have to do a higher, learn how to polar line it or learn how to make it go where you want it to go. But that would be the next step. And it would be a recommendation because of the focal length it gives. However, I really like low power views. Uh, I found that many times in people's quest for magnification, mm -hmm. they forget about the beauty of low power wide field viewing. We had a star party at uh, State Park here on Saturday night. And um, I had uh, a, a first light, uh, 102 millimeter, 640 focal length telescope out with a 26 millimeter plossal that comes with it. And people were just excited to look at the moon through that telescope. Uh, we put a higher powered eyepiece on it that the eyepiece cost more than the telescope did by a factor of two or three. And it was nice, but the moon was low in the sky and and uh, there was a lot of boiling going on. It's kept as the night went on. It got the viewing got worse and worse. But you know, Saturn with that telescope was a beautiful little sharp gem up there in the sky. You mm -hmm. can clearly tell it had um, a ring. Uh, you could see separation uh, in the rings. Uh, you had to look at it. You had to wait for those moments of seeing. And I tell people about the sky is making the stars twinkle which also makes the scene of the planet move around. All of a sudden it would just stop. And then it goes back and, and people would go, I saw that. That was amazing. And they just want to sit there and wait more and more for those moments where a scene settled down for just a second. Right. And they were like, wow, that is so cool. And, you know, that's why you can't magnify a planet a whole bunch most times because if the stars are twinkling a bunch, you're just magnifying the twinkling. You know? you're, and, and the planet is big enough that you can't see the twinkle. You know, the, the star is literally a pinprick and the temperatures and density of the air, dust, all humidity makes it twinkle, change shape. It's actually refracting the air. So it's pointing at your eye and then that air comes through the different density and it points over here. And it snaps back and it points over here and it snaps back. So basically it's directing the light sort of away from your eye. And so on those moments that scene settles down, all that light is just puddling into your eye. It's fantastic when you see it. Mm. And on nights where it's just perfectly stable and you can sit there and just drink in uh, the swirls and the bands on Jupiter. Mm, fantastic. Fantastic. Even a low power telescope. Fantastic. So, so if I was, if I was um, having to make a choice, uh, you know, w what is it that you would be showing me, you know? Well, I would, ask you, three different I, would ask, instruments. I would ask you some questions. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Uh, what's your lights look like? What does your light pollution look like? Uh, what's your budget? Because the budget is a constraint, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's just like anything else, it's, especially like computers, you know, you but it's not because, you know, computers, you want to buy the biggest, baddest, fastest computer you can afford because it's going to be slow and antiquated in what? Two years, Cameron, three years, you know, it's going to yep. be out, outpaced by technology. Telescopes aren't that way. I'm a big advocate in, in, in not throwing money at it. I'm an advocate of throwing time at it because if you get like people who are wanting to start astrophotography, they see people with 152s and 165s and 127s, which are all diameters of a telescope. And that's what they want because they want to do that work. 
and I've probably used it here on the show before. Mm-hmm. That's like watching the Indy 500 and decide you want to be an Indy car driver. Well, okay. You, you, so, so you asked me what what is what is my price range or what's your price? What's your price? Range? How much money do you have? And then I try. What do you want to look at? If I'm know? buying it for my son, I'm not into astronomy, uh, and I don't know if he's going to like it or not. And I'm probably not going to spend. How you know, old is your son? How old I'm is your really son? Really into it, you know. So how old so is your son? Eight. Eight. I'd start off with either a small. Dobsonian telescope or binoculars Mm -hmm. and buy two pair of binoculars. So you and he can go sit out in the backyard and look at things at the same time and have conversations. That's That's exactly, that's exact. And I literally people say, well, I I want to buy this thousand dollar telescope. And I said, well, you can, but your son may not like it, you know? And I tell people a lot of times kids crave time with you. They don't crave time, you know, playing soccer, or looking at, or at astronomy most times. The average kid doesn't. We know a few kids like Libby who do, but they crave time with you. And if you mm-hmm. go out and spend an hour looking at the moon and Jupiter and Saturn with binoculars, and an eight-year-old can run a pair of binoculars pretty well. So you don't get, don't get a big astronomical binoculars. Get a pair of 10 by 50s or 10 by 42s, something small, lightweight that they can go do. And, you know, binoculars is the way to go. And, you know, some people take that advice and some people don't, you know, and it's whatever fits them. I give them the best advice I can after asking questions. And I'll ask them a lot of questions. What kind of mechanical ability does he show? Does he, does he fumble around with a pair of pliers or is he pretty good with pliers? Or, you know, is he, does he show some sense of, of, of good motor control? Because, you have to have that to be able to use anything, right? Binoculars, game controller, writing with a pen. It's all about fine motor control, right? And, you know, it's just every kid's different, but spend time with them. So, Scott, did that answer the question? It's part of it. Yeah, that's that would that starts to lead me into it. Um, uh, so, you know, I see you leaning very heavily towards the Dobsonian telescope. Uh, and I, I too, you know, uh, having sold a lot of Dobsonians, you know, I, I love the, you know, more, in, uh, you know, more value per inch of a- aperture in a Dobsonian telescope. I've had people that uh, want to jump right into astrophotography. We, ha- we know of like uh, Nico the Hammer, who does astrophotography through his Newtonian Dobsonian telescope just by having a camera attached and pushing it. Okay. He has no motor control or anything. That's not easy to do. Okay. Uh, but, but it is doable. Um, uh, you know, if I have, uh, this, um, uh, desire to get into it and, you know, what aperture should I, what what aperture should I consider getting started if I'm not going to go the binocular route? But I want to keep I want to keep the budget tight. You know, where do where do you start me? Six or eight inch, and don't go binocular route. A six or eight inch to a ten inch. I mean, you know, you're under a thousand dollars with a ten inch. You know, if you've got to yeah, go, yeah, I'm, I'm not spending any more than three hundred bucks. Three hundred bucks. God, you're pinning me down, Scott. You're killing me. <laughs> Um, a National Geographic 114 millimeter telescope. Okay. Because, because we're talking about a eight year old wanting to use it, spend the money if you can to get an Altaz mount with slow motion controls. Um, an eight year old mastering an equatorial is a challenge. I mean, for them to know how to polar line it and be able to get it close, then understand how to unlock the axes and spin them around and find the, the subject, the, the target is a challenge. Um, where you get something like our, uh, um, the National Geographic 114 millimeter on a slow motion control. It's a Alt-Az solid mount. little telescope on a- You're talking mount. about an Altaz mount, right? Talking about an Altaz mount, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and by Altaz, we mean like a camera tripod, left, right, up, down, right? Yeah. Everybody understands left, right, up, down. 
the problem is when you look in the eyepiece, depending on how many mirrors there are and how many how many how many how many elements there are, it might be upside down, it might be flipped. So it takes some skill to look in there. And go, okay, I'm looking at it. It's moving to the left, so I've got to turn this knob this way to get it centered back up. There's some mm-hmm. skill to learn there. That's where that fine motor control comes in. And so I would say a 114 millimeter telescope on a um, alt as mount with slow motion controls, water slow motion controls. Slow motion controls are these little rubber arms with knobs that let you turn them very e- very easily. And they actually move them out with gears left, right, and up and down. And so it's yeah, left, smoothly. right, and up and down very mm-hmm. smoothly. Whereas if you have to grab that pan handle and unloosen it, unloosen it like a tripod and then move it, it's sort of ham handed, if you will. You know, it works, but 300 bucks, you could probably get into a 114 millimeter with a good starting slow motion control controls and be able to follow your target across the sky pretty easily, keeping it in the field of view. Mm-hmm. And so if I ahead. come back and I go, okay, uh, based off my budget, do you still recommend, do you recommend getting a telescope stronger or do you recommend getting binoculars as a stronger way to get involved? Now, again, I'm looking at planets, okay? Planets uh, viewed through a binocular is going to be pretty low magnification. Pretty low magnification. And uh, everything through binoculars is going to be low magnification. Right. You know, uh, so it, it's magnification versus magnification. Low power, low cost, easy to handle. A little bit more money, more magnification, uh, more complicated to handle. Yeah. Uh, some more skills to learn. Yes. Uh, that that you have to learn. But with binoculars, there's skills too. You have to learn how to focus one eye and then focus the diopter, right? And that's a skill. That's a hard skill for nature. And you have to hold two little telescopes with your hands, yeah. right? And so, and so a, a trick, and I promote this all the time, put on a cap, pull it down, and then you can hook your binoculars on the bill of your cap. Boy, there's a picture right there. How about that? You can hook <laughs> You can hook Looking the good, binoculars. Right? Good. <laughs> you can hook the binoculars and pull it down. And so now, instead of you holding them here and trying to hold them steady, yeah, the cap. It's a, you gotta have a fitting cap, and on one size fits all. The cap hooks down on your head, and now by doing this, you've locked the binoculars to your head. There you go. Right, and right. so it's easier to point and and makes it. Um, Plus, you're keeping that vibration light out. from hitting your eyes as you're looking through the Correct. Binoculars. Yeah. You're, you're so, shielding your from street lights or whatever. Right. So, we're, uh, Kent and I are kind of going through this exercise because we know most of the people watching this program have either already gotten their first telescope or uh, you're seasoned amateur astronomers. Okay. But I would say probably over half of you will encounter scenarios where you're doing educational outreach you know you might do sidewalk astronomy like uh, donna smith and the san francisco sidewalk astronomers do um you may be in your front yard you may have friends and family over stuff like that and it you know undoubtedly it's going to come down to the point of you know well i'm i'm looking at getting something for my child or even for myself uh you know, what should I get into, you know, and with with the incredible variety of different types of telescopes that are available today, um, it's not it's not an easy answer. Um, uh, Kent is right that you want to buy as much aperture as you can are willing to uh, to uh, uh, buy. OK, because you're going to have a you're going to have a better experience. But you also have to look at portability aspects uh, and, um, you know, ease of use and durability, you know, especially if it's a kid using it. Um, You know, you don't want them to have uh, a telescope that uh, easily falls apart. This one that I have, uh, the the little 40 millimeter Kmart telescope was is kind of delicate. okay, and so uh, and it was hard to point. if I had had a bigger telescope like the Dobsonian, it would have been smooth, uh, almost no vibration, 
uh, you know, very bright, very high resolution. My parents couldn't have afforded that telescope, uh, even, you know, in, in 1970 prices. Um, but nevertheless, it would have been, uh, you know, a dream to use as a beginner. Um, I would say that, uh, um, you know, it, for the, especially for those of you who are doing educational outreach is to kind of maybe run through some of those scenarios in your head, okay? Um, you know, there are, I, I don't get brand specific with, with uh, people that are uh, looking at their first telescope. And the reason why I don't is because, let's be very honest, there's some great brands. You know, Celestron's a great brand. Mead had great telescopes. Uh, uh, even used ones from years ago are fantastic. And telescopes don't just like wear out very easily. Okay, so uh, an old uh, 1965 uh, six inch Newtonian um, probably works just as well as it did when it was new, you know, so, um, you know, because the optics aren't going to wear out, you know, starlight's not going to uh, destroy the, uh, the, the optical surface. Uh, coatings may have to be redone, stuff like that, but we're talking about minimal maintenance uh, with a good solid telescope which kind of uh, leads you into the discussion of uh, maybe you're putting out a little bit more money for a better telescope, but that better telescope is probably going to last you for a long, long time and something that you can hand down to your kids and maybe even down to your grandkids. And that's the idea of it. So, but, um, and that's kind of the, you know, this is the reason why we have this first light Chronicles uh, program is uh, to, discuss the beginnings of uh, exploring the sky, uh, you know, uh, so that people can just have a better experience, you know, and it never hurts to go back to the basics of things. So I do it all the time. Uh, we had some interesting uh, comments here. Um, uh, Book Davies uh, recommends that he would go seven or eight inch aperture as a beginner telescope. Uh, Harold Locke says, I've got a five inch, 1500 millimeter Celestron Mac Cassegrain that ha that is so, so slow on light, it's F10, uh, that he can't stand it. Okay. <laughs> so, so Harold, I would say that you're probably someone that was, uh, is more fascinated with deep sky objects than you are planets. Um, you know, because you want to see a nice bright uh, Orion Nebula, for example. Uh, or bright galaxy, uh, and, and with all that focal length, yeah, it's a little tough. Um, let's see. <laughs> Pekka is saying, Kent, you have to sell them a whole remote controlled observatory from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, they, I, you'd be surprised it's how many people think. hard to swallow. <laughs> there, you'd be surprised how many people feel that way. They think that they've got to have everything from the beginning observatory big telescope go to all the cameras and people will call and we'll talk about things and i'll say okay yeah but have you used the telescope oh well no because i've got to figure out the uh, the the smith and heimer and the fagel wiggle to make the hoffen flicker work and i go but but have you tried using the telescope mm -hmm. no go use the telescope just go outside tonight and just use it. Don't worry about it getting in perfect collimation or perfect polar alignment. Yeah, don't, you know, don't overthink it, you know. You don't let your quest for perfection to get in your way of using the telescope. And enjoying and the sky. Enjoying the sky. Go out there and do it. You know, Brent Snyder's comment, uh, with the 1045C, I watched one of the Jupiter's moons disappear and one start to eclipse while being able to make out the great red spot. It sets up pretty quickly and has traveled with me and the family. It's a fun scope. Now, uh, you know, he's talking about the 1045C, but that comment works for any trust tube Dobsonian telescope. And it's also going to work for any other telescope. You got to use it. The more you use it, the more you're going to learn. And the more you learn, the more you're going to enjoy it. The more you're going to see, the more you're going to learn, and you're just going to get better and better. And suddenly somebody's going to be walk by if you're out in your front yard and ask you what it is. You're going to find yourself doing outreach and answering questions, and you're the authority. You're, That's you're, right. You become a sky god 
in their eyes because you're able to make this thing show me that. And you might have been doing it for a month, but they think, man, this guy's wow, look what yeah, he, he knows how to pick shatter now. This guy, you know? yeah, you know, and you go out there and do it, just go do it for sure. Um, okay, all right, so we're going to kind of stay on this theme of, uh, of, you know, what kind of telescope a beginner should get, because there's so many different ways that you can come into this problem. So we'll kind of run through these scenarios and I'll challenge Kent more as we uh, have uh, more programs, but uh, he's being a good sport. So that's good. Uh, All right. Know, Is there any, anything else, any other, you know, like, words of wisdom is, that you'd like to. The, the best telescope is, is the one you have. Go out and hmm. figure out how to use it. Right. It's like, what's the guy, the hammer? What's what, uh, Nico, Nico, the hammer. Yeah. Nico, the hammer, Nico, the hammer for those people who haven't seen him on the, the global star parties. And, and this broadcast is seen by lots of people after the broadcast is over. They, they, you know, so it's not just the people who are regulars that we're talking to. Nico the Hammer uses a telescope sort of like the one behind Scott, a Dobsonian telescope. And he does astrophotography with it. And he literally hand guides. He just looks at the monitor and just pushes the telescope along and takes pictures and then stacks up those images and does astounding work and if you ask somebody put that picture up and say you know he's got a, you know so what do you think a, that was taken with you're, yeah. you 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 are not thinking that oh this was taken with a dobsonian telescope right right so look up nico the hammer and look at some of his pictures you don't have to have a whole set of observatory set up to go do this peck approves that peck is working with with limited gear in sweden and, and, and learning how to do astrophotography or uh, solar photography right now, he's making it work. He's got a balcony. He's got light pollution. That doesn't stop him. Overcome the obstacles. Find ways to make what you have work. And as you can afford it, upgrade your gear. But tonight's the night to start if you haven't started. You've got a telescope and it's clear. Tonight's the night. Go out there and start using your telescope. That's right. Okay. Right. I'm going right. to bow off. I've got good some advice from the president of the Sugar Creek Astronomical Society. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> oh, and there's another awesome, point. Ken. There's great. another point. If there's no Astronomical Society in your neck of the woods, somebody's got to start one. Wonder who should do it. Hmm. Maybe you should. Maybe and you should. <laughs> maybe you should. That's right. Because, you know, if you look around wondering, well, well no one started uh, 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 an astronomical society or uh, you know okay you're someone if you need help or ideas contact me send an email to yeah. explore alliance at explore scientific.com annie will route you to me and i will help you through that process of how to start an astronomy club it takes work um it takes dedication uh in this day and age it, it's it's both easier and more challenging to get a hold of people. So if you don't have one, ask me. We'll work on getting you started. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna bow out. Cameron, right. have fun. Thanks, Scott. You bet. Thanks. Hey, you. Bye, everybody. Have a good one. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff, Ken. Yeah, there's a nice little comment here. There's some more comments I'll I'll uh I'll uh, read off here. One of them was um uh oh I've I've lost already, but uh someone had uh uh was given a, uh, here it is, Gary Alban, watching on YouTube. He says, when I was 14, my father bought me a secondhand Unitron. Okay, I used to sell Unitrons. They're great telescopes. A Unitron 75 millimeter model 140. It's a refractor. Um, it was a telescope from the 1950s, but it was new to me in 1984. And he says, I still love that uh, telescope today. So that's very good. Um, and uh, let's see, <laughs> Mike Wiesner says, oh, I lo uh, a Unitron, love their ads on the back cover of the magazine and Sky and Telescope. That's true. They had classic ads. Um, Book Davies uh, has 100, my, my poor wee 120 millimeter acro refractor has kept me very happy. And the, uh, uh, the 10 inch reflector that I'm making uh, a Dobson, Dobsonian mount for so I'm good for a while yet, but 
but I still look for the next step up. I guess we all do. We get aperture fever. Hey, but anyways, hey, Scott, uh, thanks. I, yes. I, we said Unitron ads, and I, I couldn't remember what a Unitron ad looked like. So here's oh, I have some of the Unitron ads burned in my memory. Yeah, here's a Unitron ad. I, 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 I don't remember Unitron ads. Oh, yeah, wow. alas, the telescope you can afford. This is from, uh, it says somewhere. I remember the mount was it was actually the really. It says 2.4 inch. 1952. Inch, uh, really good mount. Really good uh, uh, equatorial mount. Does that say on the right 2.4 inch refractor? Yes, equatorial yeah. refractor. For how yeah. much? Was Two hundred and twenty-five dollars. Two hundred and twenty-four dollars. Too many Christmas. Hang on a second. Holy smokes, that's 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 Hang on. It's thousands. Yeah. Thousands. Hang on yeah. Just a second. The mount is 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 more than half. That that, that is a that's a very nice the wow. Unitron Equatorial mount. I remember that was the the beautiful mount. As yeah, you can it see. was. It was. Yeah. Yeah. And and very nice optics, you know. But I will argue that you can have eighty percent of that quality. For yes. uh, way less money, and uh, oh, yeah. today, Nowadays, yeah. so the value yeah. in telescopes available to you today is amazing. So you're, you're not going to believe this. Getting geared up is very affordable today. That telescope today would cost two thousand three hundred dollars. Two thousand wow. three hundred nice. for a two point four inch refractor. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. on a very simple. Yeah, that's not even 80 millimeters. So that's a 75 millimeter. That's effectively the same telescope that uh, Gary Alban got. Okay. Um, uh, you They're know. acromats. Yeah. And they were acromats, long, long F ratio acromats. So they were relatively low chromatic aberration. They, they produce excellent images. That's true. That's true. But, uh, anyways, that's my point. Um, even a telescope from the 1950s is works perfectly well today. So, right. okay, to put that in perspective, you can buy a uh, 152 millimeter doublet from us for under a thousand dollars. To put right. that in perspective, so in 1950s or whenever this was 1952. That's a 52 ad. Okay, yes, sir. Yeah, so it would have been roughly the same price. Uh, yeah, and, and or maybe a, less. And put a put a equatorial. It had to be a fairly big equatorial mount. So, okay, even if you got an X uh, or Exos two with PMC eight system, mm -hmm. you're still under two thousand oh, dollars. Yeah, a couple of eyepieces will push you up to two thousand dollars. Right. Oh boy, that's crazy. All right, I'm gonna take off. Hey, you gotta go, Kent. Yep, I gotta go. I, <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta take care of our dealers. Everybody have fun. And all uh, right, all right Thank bye you, everybody. Sir. Thanks for coming. Bye, Kent. So long. Okay, so we're gonna transition over to uh, Cameron. Uh, uh, normally, I do a kind of an intro for Cameron, but uh, we know who he is, right? So, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, Scott. And yep. uh, yeah, th th this earlier topic that you had, um, I you know I have. I love that. It's a very passionate subject of mine uh, to kind of help. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, everyone has an opinion, of course, of how you start from your own experience, right? What sure. kind of scopes? But, but I think a key thing, of course, is about expectations, setting expectations, finding out what what the person wants to see, and mm -hmm. uh, what, how they want to grow, and and lay out all the options. Because uh, you know, as a lot of the audience has said on the on the chat, is really you need, you know, as you get into this hobby. Uh, you want to have multiple telescopes, of course, right? You want to have an, an arsenal. Your tool chest. <laughs> you got your tool you chest. And probably more than one tool, you know? Absolutely, so. for all different types. So when when starting out, yeah, I, I think um, a Newtonian of some kind, right? An Altaz Newtonian, whether it's a Dobsonian or is, is the best price because it gives you wide field of views. And Dobsonians are awesome because just some of the mechanics, uh, to your point, um, I think it's important to note that you can point one of the biggest challenges start beginners have is finding stuff, right? Yes. And, and, and or even if, if they do find stuff, if the mount's not real stable, they like yeah, it, it moves around and shakes around and yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so this having a nice wide, rich field, uh, daub 
um, that gives a, a nice contrast. Uh, it, you know, like what you have there. What I what I love is um, is you have to think about the fulcrum, right? I mean, it's the same way when you would, if you want to make a manual slow motion uh, focuser on your Schmidt cast screen, you, you you tape a popsicle stick on it. Right? Yeah. And then and then you move that, and that gives you a fine focus. The same thing, same principle, fulcrum and lever with uh, with the uh, Dobsonian. Uh, you actually bigger scopes, bigger Dobsonians are easier to point because you're so far away from the pivot, right? From the fulcrum mm -hmm. that you, you you can really do like subtle adjustments. So it it kind of compensates for your focal length. But anyhow, uh, no, I, I I love that. And then my my other, I I think. Yeah, a 10 inch Mac, uh, or sorry, 10 inch um, daub is awesome. Eight inch daub, any any daub, even even a, a small four inch, you know, tabletop uh, is, right. is a good start. But then mm -hmm. uh, a Mac, I love Macs. They're awesome. From when we were talking about planets, Macs uh, totally are, are, are would be my choice for a small scope if you want it, especially if you're traveling. Mm -hmm. um, Macs are great. But uh, but the challenge again there you you know it's as I still would call that a more advanced scope because you have such high focal length that uh, it's it's difficult to, uh, because it's you typically limited to inch and a quarter um, you know uh, eyepieces so you, you you're going to have limited field of view so finding objects and keeping them centered is is a key uh, challenge but anyhow. I digress. Uh, I, I just uh, just love it. Um, so now we're going to go into episode 17 of uh, of Cam Astronomy. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So if, if you recall, let me just uh, put into presentation mode. Okay. So we are still in Cygnus. Um, we've we are looking at our subset of best and brightest objects. Uh, to date, we've explored over 200, now 212 images uh, together. Wow. Uh, of 143 objects. <laughs> so it's we're we're getting there. We're going we're going through, and it's it's really nice because you can see the wide variety of objects we're going through. We started off earlier with galaxies uh, in Virgo, um, globular clusters, planetary nebulae open clusters now and, and uh, diffuse nebulae. And uh, so we're, we're, we're going through, and these are all objects that you should be able to see even in light blue size skies. I'm taking images of them, but uh, you should be able to see uh, with, with, your, with a moderate size scope uh, to be able, or a smaller telescope to be able to see um, uh, either directly or with a vertivision. And some of them, of course, especially some of the clusters uh, are great binocular objects. So mm -hmm. today, today we're going to go through uh, 17 new images, um, uh, but they're focused on five new objects because we're just wrapping up Cygnus now. And if I go to uh, Sky Safari, oops. Now, Cameron, you made these 17 images over how many nights? Oh, over months. Uh, it's, it's Months, it's, okay. It's, yeah, it's basically, um, I've taken some images with my smartphone um, on some nights, and then in in June, for example, and then okay. some in July, and some now in August and September. Uh, so, so yeah, we have uh, we're still in July as far as the images, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's been taken over several nights. I'm not stacking the images over to the month nights. These are just mm -hmm. uh, the uh, different objects over different nights. Um, so uh, if we look, oops, let's go back to the presentation. Now, now. I, I know that you work quickly as, as you're, you're doing that. Is, does it, are you waiting mostly for like new moon weekends or are you looking for oh, new I, moon weekend plus, I, I, and you're in Seattle, so I know that there's also a lot of clouds. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I take any night I can get. Um, okay. Even, uh, even lower transparency and uh, uh, to your point, yes, whether it's moon or not, um, I, I, I take the images and uh, I haven't done the, the, the in-depth analysis to look at contrast with, you know, based on the moon and the, and the sky glow uh, and transparency. But, because, but what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I'm able to record what I visually observed um, and, and follow through. And even though it's 
quickly, it's actually at a nice pace because let's say a typical object takes me 10 minutes, let's say, to, to get a reasonable, because I'm taking maximum exposure I'm taking right now, Scott, is uh, with my Altaz is 30 seconds, right? So, okay. so, so basically that allows me to get, you know, sometimes there's a drift and I have to take a new picture. Um, uh, sometimes uh, there's a, a, you know, I get photobombed by some, some uh, satellites. Um, sure. You know, sometimes maybe there's a cloud or whatever. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, but that gives me enough time to, to in a comfortable way. Uh, and it's, it's very relaxing to be able to look at it and, Critically look at the images. Like, yep, that's that's a good. I've captured pretty much what I've seen, or, or I've got a decent image, so that when I come back to it with a more deeper survey, uh, and and as I get better with my astrophotography techniques, uh, and I can take longer exposures, I have calibration frames. As I do that, I at least I have an image that is kind of like a snapshot, right? That gives me uh, some sense of the object's location. Uh, the size, the type of object, so it helps me with my descriptions. And then after we've done this first round, uh, kind of a rough, you can say, sky survey, then we'll go through and I'll have a really nice uh, procedure workflow uh, that will give me really good, consistent results. And uh, and then I'll probably be a little more fussy about which nights I, I take certain objects. Um, and I might be taking images over multiple nights, for example, on the same object and stacking them. But for now, uh, I'm just going through and I'm basically making my catalog, my first broad brush. And uh, and yeah, um, it's I can take, you know, in a given night, let's say I have a good solid two hours. I can take, uh, you know, 15, record about 15 objects in a, in a good night. Um, and, and so that's, that gives me, it makes it, it's very comfortable. I can record it all. And then I have the images stored and, um, yeah, it works out really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, so, so basically I am, we, we were going, we were kind of doing a circle around, um, let me just change the time here to make it more favorable for an Altas. Let's go a little bit earlier here. Okay, so Cygnus is directly overhead uh, these nights uh, where I'm at Zenith. So I, I I took these images when Cygnus was lower, but we started off, of course, in the southwestern uh, part of Big Cygnus, kind of looped around here, and we ended up with the Cocoon Lambula. And if I go to my my images, let's go back here, hmm. and uh, so this is my Cocoon Nebula, and um, you know uh, th that was uh, my last one. Still has some noise. It's uh, it's not the greatest, but it's not an easy object to, to capture. But at least you can see some structure, and uh, and you have that. So that was the last object. And now we're going to move on to some. Uh, if I go to Sky Safari, mm -hmm. the last object we're going to. There's a couple of galaxies here in the southeastern quadrant of Cygnus, and then we're going to end up in uh, in the Veil Nebula, the complex. So okay. let's go to let's go to IC 1392. So we'll click on that. Zoom in, zoom in there. And 1392 in a pretty it's a pretty rich star field. You, you'll see when I pick the image. So here's the image frame. And if I look at the specifications on this guy, it's almost a 12th magnitude uh, galaxy. So it's per, it's on the edge of kind of uh, what you can see. Uh, with an eight inch in portal six, let's say portal seven skies. Okay. 200, 220 million light years away though. So all the objects we've been looking at so far, of course, like the, like, like the cocoon nebula have been thousands of light years away because they're within our galaxy. But now yeah. this is a, this galaxy is 220 million. So it's really million. far away. Yeah. yeah. Million light years away. Exactly. Jeez. So if we look at, look at the image, this is the smartphone image. Let me just put it in presentation. So here we go. This is so as you can see, uh, not much to see. Um, actually, I, I, I circled where it is with reference to this the star. Um, I when I when I play with the brightness and stuff, I can see just a slight patch, but the smartphone just doesn't pick it out with 10 second exposure. So that's my smartphone. Okay. Uh, this is with my um, 
my first attempt, or not my first attempt, my, my first uh, round before I had calibration frames and all that of my um, yeah. using my 294 back in June. Um, you can see it's between like two the stars, HY camera. Is, this is actually a, a ZWO, uh, ZWO 294, camera. Okay. 294, yeah, 294 MC. And uh, so it's uncool. And uh, it's, you know, they run about uh, these days, they're, I think the camera is around 600 bucks. It's, it's not bad. Okay. Um, you know, very reasonable. I highly recommend it for entry. Uh, it has a good pixel scale and it, it's uh, it, it, one single connection, USB 3. And uh, yeah, so this is just a 30 second uh, picture. And, um, you know, I, this is one of my earlier pictures. So, uh, but you can still see very clearly uh, there is the galaxy. And you can actually see uh, this other galaxy down here um, uh, as well. Uh, and then this one here, if you take a look at the visual place, how barely you can just, you might be able to make it out. But, but let's take a look at this neighboring galaxy that's right beside it, just down here. So let's go to back to uh, Sky Safari. And let's change, let's pump up the, um, the uh, deep sky magnitude. So right now we, I've set the threshold to 13th magnitude. So let's go down to, 16th magnitude. So now you can see this this galaxy that was picked up in my image. It's a magnitude 14.45. It's a U, UGC galaxy. And this is part of the fun about the sky survey is visually I'm picking out, of course, the image is uh, the target image is 1392. But when I, I, you know, when I take my uh, astro camera images, I pick out some of these fainter galaxies. And this is part of the fun, the follow up fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I take a look at this guy, it's 200. See, it's only a little bit. It's only 10 million light years further than the other one. But quite a bit smaller and fainter. So that's rather interesting. So it's it's kind of a neighbor to this this guy. And if I go back uh, to my presentation, yeah. So so that you can see him actually quite quite interesting. Even though it's fainter magnitude, it's uh, it's it shows up quite quite clearly. Um, NGC 7013. Let's go to uh, that guy. If we zoom back out, I'm going to get it at the lay always whenever I switch. There we go. So now we're moving closer to uh, the Veil Nebula complex. So let's zoom in. Capture these galaxies here. 7013. It's quite a large galaxy, magnitude 11.2. And that is 49, so it's much closer, 49 million light years. Uh, so it's uh, pretty close by there. And the smartphone uh, actually just, I don't know if you can see, but you can clearly see the star here right on the edge. But this is the center very, very faintly. Uh, you can barely see it. It actually picks it out. So I was very happy to be able to even eke that guy out. Um, and then this is the smart, uh, sorry, this is the, um, Astro camera, the 294 picture, and uh, you can see a nice, uh, you know, elliptical or not elliptical, uh, elongated uh, spiral uh, structure, similar to like an Andromeda uh, galaxy, even maybe mm -hmm. even a dust lane there, uh, if, mm -hmm. if you look carefully. So, so in the future, when I have my when I come back to these objects and I take, you know, better exposure, you can see this is not this has the uh, amp glow and it has the lines, it has the big netting. This is before I did calibration, but the main point is the target. So I got I got the target, and um, and it shows up pretty pretty nicely. And this is this is actually pretty clear to what you'll see visually. Um, you know, maybe not as you'll have to do averted vision, but you, direct vision you'll see the core, and uh, it, that's basically. It. And then it's interesting to note there's some other fainter galaxies here that uh, that are much smaller, but um, in the future, I could I could probably pick those guys out with an image. Okay, now let's go to the crown jewel of the summer skies and uh, and everyone's favorite object um, in Cygnus, or one of is the Veil Nebula. So I'm going to start off in the east uh, on on the western. I'm going to switch around. I'm going to go to the western Veil Nebula. And that's around 52 Cygni. So it's very easy to find if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're doing binoculars or 
or you're doing, uh, you know, star hopping with a dog. Mm -hmm. Basically, you just go off. Of, uh, you have the Cygnus cross here, right, which is the okay. key. And then you just go off of uh, you, what you do is you look for a triangle right off of this. And that's 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 your that's your go to. So basically, once you have this triangle, you, you want to go to this. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. that, that's how I find it, at least. There's that different ways. Away. But that's that's there's a triangle and, and that's that gives you that gives it away. And then once you center on this guy, let's take a look at the uh, specs. It says it's magnitude five, which it is, but it's very extended. So it's, uh, but but you know, with binoculars on a dark sky, it's amazing what you could do with this. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember um, with the eleven by eighty, it's just like wow, right? It's uh, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the image information, two point six thousand light years. So the whole complex, it's a supernova net remnant. So it's not, it's beyond planetary nebula stage it's like very much extended <laughs> and uh and basically uh yeah and it's yeah so it's quite i think um the, i don't know the size of it um i have to check out the, oh, the, the whole the size here. Region, it's pretty big so uh, it's really large it's really huge i mean uh, it's imagine you can probably do the math right just do you use trigonometry and say okay two point six thousand light years away and this many arc seconds 50 across. light years in diameter it's, 50, thank you, Scott, 50 light years. There you go. So that's, ma so imagine that. 50 wow. times 5.9 trillion, that's how many miles? There you go. Wow. So um, so that's the whole complex. So now if we look at the images now, let's go down to back here. So this is my first image back in June where I took a mosaic. And here's 52 Cygni. And uh, up this part here, this whole thing is called the witch's broom because kind of has a, a stick here which mm -hmm. is narrow and then it kind of fans out into these uh these little tendrils and um you can see in this image a very crude um image i took lots of big netting no calibration at all um but basically this is this is what you'll see and i also have a narrow field of view so if you have a wider field telescope obviously you, you you're this is a much better pro uh, product or uh, target for you to to take, and obviously with um, wide field scopes, it will be with an oxygen three, oxygen three filter. I I remember seeing um, the veil the first time with my eighteen inch daub. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah. With an oxygen three. Yeah, it's pretty mind blowing. Three. Oh my gosh! It was like I was, was like, wow! You can see this, you know, with your direct vision, you can see all the structure. You can actually you can see all of this. Yeah, uh, not the not the color, but you can you can see all these tendrils. So everything you see here, if you have any, just to set expectations, if you're in a dark sky, you have a, a UHC or an oxygen tree filter with a big daub, you're going to see this, and it's it's awesome. It's a really fun. Anyhow, uh, and here is my better picture. Uh, now it's a, almost oh, yeah. three weeks later. I learned how to do calibration a little better, so you, I flattened it out. Right, there's still some noise. But much nicer. You can see much better structure here in the upper part of the broom, nicer colors, and a more continuous around 52 Sigmi. Uh, so this is this is my mosaic uh, upgraded, and then even further upgraded. Um, I I took uh, several uh, stacks and um, combined them together, and you can see even better contrast. Um, so really nice uh, structure, but again, still some noise. And a photo bomb on the satellite, but I'm very happy to be able to see this kind of uh, detail and structure. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of my latest yeah. and greatest. <laughs> the colors in that 03 um, kind of blue green aqua color. It's nice. Yes. Yeah. It's a really pleasing. And I, 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 yeah, exactly. And this is natural color. I, I'm not using the Hubble palette or anything. So this is actually the real, the real colors. I'm using a UHC filter though. Um, but that, that just basically, uh, it doesn't yeah i'm not because it's an rgb um bayer matrix i'm not doing anything fancy with that um and so and here's the central field so now pickering's triangle so if we go let's go back to uh over here so then i panned over my my field of view to here with my imaging uh to the pickering's triangle 
And that's actually, it's, it's fairly faint. It's more diffuse. And you, it's harder to find because it's, you don't have a reference star like 52 Sigma. So you kind of have to jog over and do some visual place solving about some of these brighter stars. But uh, one thing that you, I can say about it is it, with a bigger telescope, of course, it's, it has good contrast. So it's not bright. It doesn't have this high, strong contrast, upper, like the upper witcher's boom on the Western Vale. But, uh, but it does have some good structure. So if you do have a bigger scope, you'll still, it's definitely worth going to Pickering's Triangle and checking all this nebulosity out. It's really, really nice. But this is my smartphone image. Here's my visual or some of my, my plate solve. It's in the right area. But this is just bean, carabining or whatever. It's uh, just a big netting and then uh, ocular uh, effects. So there's, there's not really any nebulosity. So couldn't pick up any nebulosity with my smartphone with 10 seconds, so just limited there. Here's, uh, here's my first smartphone um, without any calibration. You could just barely make out some structure here. Not very, very hard. Um, so not, not good, but you know, that was in early July. Now I'm starting to get better. And this is, I think this is the best I could do, uh, where I was able to get good calibration frames. Um, I don't know what was causing this uh, white, this brightness over here, but at least I can see now some structure in the um, in the Pickering's triangle. Oh, here's here's my best one. Sorry. Uh, so now it's more flat. You can start to pick out um, some color, and and also the two different kind of sections, well, three different sections of Pickering's triangle around here. Uh, and then I did a mosaic in the in second part of July, July 18th. And uh, this one got a little better contrast, but I was able to put the whole region together. And uh, it's, a, it's more difficult because it um, doesn't have the same signal with noise uh, like, like the Western Vale. Next one, let's go back, uh, oh, sorry. Now we have the Eastern Vale. So let's go back to our Sky Safari. And it's quite a bit further. What's interesting is you kind of kind of judge when you're doing star hopping or if you're using a dog with a telerad. This the eastern and western veil are really far. So Pickering's triangle is pretty close to the western veil, but but the eastern veil is way off. So it's very easy when you're playing around uh, to try to find it. Uh, but when you do find it, it's very high contrast. This is actually the brightest part of the veil nebula. Um, Eastern Bell, and you'll see that with the imaging as well. Um, but the way you find it, it is, is the opposite triangle. So you, you see this triangle here of stars uh, that I was mentioning earlier to find 52 Sigmi. You kind of extend it down here, and, and this area here is really interesting, uh, part of the, the Eastern Bell. And if we go to the images, so this is my first one. And um, you can see the structure, uh, but lots of big knitting, of course. But you can see the color, and you can see the nice, uh, uh, you know, fibery uh, structure down here, and then these these forks that come out on the southern part. This is my second best picture, uh, where I did some mosaic. You can see I had some good signal from the noise, still some uh, banding issues, but but much more clear structure, nice rich star field, and you can see some of the uh, tendrils coming out here, and how it just nicely wraps and it's interesting to see how the inner part here is all kind of this uh, red color and then the outer part is more the green color so that's kind of neat and then finally my best picture uh, on the 18th still have this problem with this banding i, I still haven't figured that out totally um but uh, but what's it's very pleasing because you can see very clear Nice, late, well defined uh, structure here, and uh, and very clear colors, and this fork here. Visually, though, it's interesting. Um, I could say that visually, this area here comes out more. Um, you can still see this, and it, it's 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 bright and it's clear for sure. But this area here is very nice. Uh, lots of structure. Oh yeah. You can I love this looking area. at this part of the veil. I mean, it's just I, so twisted. Yeah. There's the, these naughty neuraled um, regions, you know, and yes. uh, just. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, and when you think of 
you know, the kind of the the you know, if you're having the kind of this meditation that your that your body and everything is made of stardust. When you study yes. this region, you're really seeing, you know, stardust in action here. You know, because yes. this is this was expelled from a dying star. It's recoalescing with a, it has a shock wave as it's moving through space. And, you know, these impacts that it's having, the resistance it's experiencing in other gas regions and stuff is eventually going to form new stars. You know, so this is, this is, you know, this kind is of the ingredients. rebirth yes. in action, you know, so. Yeah, you're seeing the ingredients of uh, dust, yeah. Going, yeah, the yeah. alchemy of the universe right yes. there. It is. It's beautiful. It's really, it's amazing. And we get to see it. It's really cool. Yeah. So what I what I did is I, I did my early mosaic where I only had the eastern and western tail with my terrible big netting and not good flats and all that just terrible. But at least it you know it picks it up and this is where it is. But then and this is my new improved version where I include the Pickering's triangle and okay. then of course western and eastern uh, veil uh, basically what where they are. So this is the way with, the way that you had the photographs spaced is that. Is that how they're really, I mean, is that exactly. diameter? Exactly. That's okay. exactly where they are. Yeah, I, I, because I use the same image scale. Uh, each of these uh, tiles is um, is overlaid um, and and they're exactly the same image scale on my 294 with my, if I, if I take a look at this, mm -hmm. for example. Right. This is exactly, what you're seeing here is this picture down here, for example. And then I, I, I literally, I, I overlaid and I looked at this star behind the other picture. If I take that out, for example, you can see that star is right here. And that, that's how I overlaid. I, I would basically line up those stars and that's how I would manually do the mosaic. And, uh, and it was kind of like a, a double plate solving, if you will, <laughs> visual plate solving. And it was fun, uh, you know, to, to be able to, and then to your point, to make sure that it's uh, this way, I, I would basically look at the image, uh, this one here, and I would space it, space this uh, this uh, this uh, grid to be able to place the uh, the eastern veil in its appropriate place relative to Pickering's uh, triangle. So, so yeah, that's that's this. So what you're seeing here is um, is basically. Now, obviously, it, it would be nice to have a, a one shot, right? Just be able to take one, but but on the on the flip side, you know, you you have with eight inch aperture, uh, I can take these in thirty second uh, subs, right? These are all thirty second subs, and um, and uh, it will be really neat to see, uh, you know, a wide field a wide field view with an eighty eighty, for example, of the same region. It would be beautiful, um, and see what kind of subs I would need for, to be able to get equivalent. And of course, it will be a lot better noise. You'll have much more even. You're not going to have all these lines. The other thing is I noticed is as you you see the different color temperatures of the background, uh, I'm trying to I tried to keep the uh, curves the same. But what happens is uh, the as you change the orientation um, stars, these bright stars, um, whether they're in the field or not, affects your your curves and your signal to noise. And, uh, and so that that causes this um, this change in in the uh, in the background darkness, if you will. Um, so there's all sorts of fun stuff I'm I'm learning along the way, but uh, but the main thing is I'm having fun, and uh, and you all get to enjoy this journey together with me, and uh, I get to share some of my visual experiences as we as we do this uh, this photography um, astrophotography um, survey. So together so so yeah so that that's basically it and now if we go back to uh zooming back out to our sky safari so we are we have now finished cygnus so cygnus was a big one right yeah. smack in the middle so that 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 had about 30 objects so it took us uh, three three to four episodes to uh to go through cygnus and um and now we're going to move uh i want to actually go into um uh, Cepheus. So we're going to go into Cepheus, and that goes right to the to the pole. And then basically, after we've done Cepheus, I think there's about ten objects in there that are really good. There's an elephant trunk, 
Um, there's a Pac-Man, or that Pac-Man, sorry, is, is down in Cassiopeia. We're not going to get there yet. Uh, and then we have some other NGC 40s, a really awesome planetary nebula. So we're going to do all this stuff uh, next week. And then we're going to probably scoot down through Lacerta. And then I have, we have Pegasus, which is a lot, tons of beautiful galaxies in there. And then we're going to dip all the way down uh, to kep catch up with Copernicus, a couple of the uh, globular clusters, um, and Aquarius. Uh, I still don't have pictures of Helix Nebula because uh, it's not in a prime location yet. Uh, once, once I, uh, but I've got M M30 30 and I've got all the other stuff. So we still have some time. And, uh, and, but, but I do, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the way our journey is going to go. So, yeah. So thanks, Scott. And thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let's continue the journey. Yeah, that's right. So we will see you again, I guess, on Friday on Focus on Astrophotography. Yes. Uh, also, remember this, um, the 17th, I believe, we have uh, uh, the um, Astronomical League Live uh, program, which, um, you know, the, the executive officers, the Astronomical League will bring on their game again with some, you know, usually focusing on one great speaker. So uh, you, you're not going to want to miss that. And um, we'll see you also tomorrow uh, for uh, more um, more programming. Uh, uh, <laughs> why am I drawing a blank? It's on the wing uh, with uh, Dan George. So you guys have a good night and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you.